on thermal burns by Dr. Biggs. Hold on tight. Thank you, and good morning. Um, I'm going to be spending the next 30, 40 minutes talking about uh, burn injury and then followed by cold injury. So I'm starting with a rather pretty picture because some of the uh, photographs that I have are going to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, for those of you who stay awake, you get to go here. You get a free trip. <laughs> and you get to choose your cabin mate for this little boat right here, either Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> Trump, 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 yeah. All right, all right. Um, burn injury is the fourth leading cause of unintentional death in the United States. There are a million burns yearly, and these encompass all, all comers. There are about 6,000 deaths, about uh, three quarters of them are due to house fires. Scalds are the most common type of burn, and again, this is age related. Often, this is related to abuse. Children are abused by burns, elderly are abused by burns. Inhalational injury is the most common immediate cause of death, the most common late cause of death is sepsis. Cigarettes are the most common cause of, uh, of the fire, and al alcoholism is usually a factor. There are five categories of burn injury, flame, scald, contact via hot or cold, chemical burns, and electrical burns. <clears throat> what's, the, what's the mechanism? There's simply a capillary leak, so these patients need, ex need volumes of resuscitation. The skin becomes hyperemic, it loses its ability to maintain body temperature. <clears throat> the, uh, um, the blood becomes um, hemoconcentrated because fluid is extravasating into the periphery. I'm just going to talk briefly about the different kinds of burns. First degree burns are sunburns, they're clinically irrelevant. Uh, second degree burns are partial thickness burns, and they're divided into either superficial partial thickness, which involve the epidermis and the more superficial layer of epidermis. And then there are the deep partial thickness burns, which are the epidermis and the deep epidermis level. Third degree burns are, involve the entire epidermis and the entire dermis. Fourth degree burns involve structures deep, deep to that muscle skin bone. Um, some diagrams here. As I said, a first degree burn is a sunburn. It's, an, it, um, it's the equivalent of spending the day out in the sun. These patients can either come in also with a minor scald. They're painful because the nerves are attacked. They're erythematous and they blanch. There are no blisters for these. And um, it, does, it, it doesn't result in scarring. These require no therapy, Tylenol, aloe vera, whatever your treatment of choice is. For second degree burns, they're either superficial partial thickness burns. They're also red, they blanch, and they are painful because the nerves are still intact. Um, these are due to skull injuries and flash flame burns. <clears throat> these um, don't require any treatment, they um, heal, they feel like spontaneously within one or two weeks because the, 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 the deeper dermal structures involved in regeneration are intact. <laughs> For the deep partial thickness burns, they go into the deeper dermis, the reticular dermis. The skin is pale, it doesn't blanch. They still have uh, intact nerve sensation, so they are painful. They, heal, they still heal by re-epithelialization, but it can take about three to four weeks to do so. So these patients don't necessarily need skin grafting. Um, the problem is if the burn is over a joint, it can cause limitation of turn motion. The third degree burns are those that involve the entire epidermis and, um, and uh, dermis. They're hard, leathery, escar, the nerves are involved here, these are painless burns. They do heal with time if the patient doesn't get to a burn center, doesn't get these excised. Um, you really speed up the healing process by uh, excising them early and by applying um, skin grafts. Fourth degree burns involve structures under the skin, muscle, bone, brain. They often involve extensive excision or amputation, um, grafting, um, and major flap reconstruction. How do we take care of the burn patient? Burn is a trauma, a traumatic injury. We start with <clears throat> ATLS protocol, airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Stop the fire, stop the patient's uh, clothes that are on fire. Very importantly, cut the clothes off quickly, get rid of, get rid of the burning skin, get rid of the burning cloth because it just makes the burn worse. Large driving right. catheters, keep the patient warm, uh, keep them covered for the sake of pain, keep them warm because they, they've lost their ability to from that right On the secondary survey, it's important to give a, get a good estimate of, of the burn size evaluation. The 
This is where the rule of nines comes in. I'll show the diagram to, to refresh your memory. You want to rule out traumatic injury. You want to rule out carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide poisoning. Consider inhalational injury, especially if there's any mechanism for it, any use for it. Give the patient tetanus. There's no role for prophylactic antibiotics, as we know. And then IV pain net management. The rule of nines gives a rough estimate of the burn size. Easy to remember, 9, 9, 9, 18, 18, 18, 18, okay? Um, and what I learned in medical school in the South is depending on whether you're from Texas or not, um, the genitalia could be anywhere from 1 to 3%. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rule of nines in children is, is a bit different just because a child's head shape is larger than the rest of the body in, in proportion. So the head takes 20, is about 20% of the brain surface area. What do we do for the initial resuscitation after we've gone through the uh, life-threatening injuries? We want to start fluid management. And the Parkland formula, there are a lot of different formulas that, are, that have been used. The reason that the Parkland formula has stood the test of time is because it's easy to remember in a stressful situation. You can do a, a simple calculation. Um, the timing is from not the time of arrival in the emergency room, but the time of the burn injury. Um, who gets resuscitated? Who needs who is Any adult with a burn surface area of second degree or higher, which is more than 15% of the body surface area, or any child under the age of 10 who has a second, third, or fourth degree burn greater than 10% of the body surface area. Um, I, I always remember this, and it's painful because this was a critical care board question for me, and I missed it, and it's so stupidly obvious. What's the fluid that you resuscitate the patient with, uh, uh, adults and children over the age of two? Lactated ringers, of course, right? Um, it's more physiologic. These patients are acidotic. You want to give them lactate so they can get converted to bicarbonate in the liver. Uh, children under the age of two, because they're limited as far as glucose and glycogen stores, scores, where you want to give them a little uh, dextrose for their lactate ringers, so the fluid of choice is T5LR. And again, the formula, the Parkland formula, is about four cc's uh, per kilogram. Uh, the first half is given over the first eight hours, the remaining half is given over the, over the successive 16 hours. Um, and again, it's not the first degree burn, so first degree burn, is beer, second degree, third degree, fourth degree burn, we give uh, lactate okay. Just an easy way to, to solidify this, this is a 45-year-old man who weighs seven kilograms, he has a second, third degree burn over half of his body. He also suffers an inhalational injury. That's not relevant as, well, as far as volume resuscitation is concerned. What's the fluid management for this patient? So, 4 cc's per kilogram times 70 kilograms times 50% burn, he gets 14,000 cc's, you get the first half of the first eight hours, so he gets 7,000 cc's over eight hours, and then 875 cc's for the next eight hours. <coughs> As your output, this is a rough gauge. As your output drops off, you give more volume. Okay. Um, also, as, as we know, it doesn't require additional fluid for his inhalation injury. That's uh, the last time we're going to um, the point here is that if the urine output drops off, you don't want to give something other than additional fluids. Okay, so urine output is the best gauge here. Um, fluid management for the second 24 hours uh, is a bit, a bit more controversial as far, as far as management goes. Whether to give colloid or not is still, is still um, questionable, of questionable benefit. Usually after the first 24 hours, uh, the vascular uh, permeability uh, improves. Uh, um, the, over the first 12 to 24 hours. <coughs> some, some burn centers will give small doses of colloid. Uh, it's not given for smaller volumes. Okay? And then we go back to maintenance IV fluids. Okay. Some general guidelines. Patients are going to have pain. They're going to have gastric dilatation. They're getting more products. NG tube is a good, good way to go. Um, remember, they develop, they're at higher risk for, for ulcer, from hyperperfusion of the gastric mucosa. Foley catheters are good, so we can assess volume status. Stress ulcer prophylaxis with an ATP as inhibitor is a standard. Uh, pain, should, pain control should be given IV, subcutaneous pain medication is going to be absorbed. 
So the emergent surgical intervention, the emergent surgical intervention is done after a patient is stabilized, usually day two or day three at a burn center. Deep second and third degree burns that encompass an extremity need to be excised. If someone has compartment pressure, certainly that needs to be addressed early on because tissue perfusion is compromising. It just does some, some we, don't, we don't take care of major burns here, but just um, to give us an idea of, of some of the emergent procedures that could be done and need to be done in the emergency room. In a patient who's intubated, who you're having trouble ventilating because of peak pressures, um, keep in mind if the patient has a chest and a burn to the chest, a certain differential burn, you may have an equivalent of a compartment syndrome, and you may need to do um, a, an escalotomy. Um, in the textbook, there are some different diagrams of how to do this. So different surgeons have different preferences. Some will make a longitudinal incision. The way I was trained to do a longitudinal incision, I've done this very rarely. I think I've done it twice ever. Um, the other, this is uh, from Schwartz, uh, Principles of Surgery, the means to not be almost incision, and by levels of costal incisions. Some common topical agents that are used, silvidine is the most common topical agent. It's advantageous because it's broad spectrum. It gets gram positives, gram, gram negatives, and fungus. It's painless, which makes it uh, ideal. The disadvantage is that uh, there's resistance to pseudomonas, and pseudomonas is the most common organism causing uh, sepsis in the patients. So silvidine is all right for, for uh, initial treatment and for, for more superficial ones. Keep in mind that if the white, count, uh, white blood cell count drops, it may be a result of silvidine. Stop the silvidine and go to another dressing. Uh, next is silver nitrate. It's broad spectrum. It's painless. It has a sort of dark red stain. To it, it can cause electrolyte abnormalities. It has poor SCAR penetration. Uh, sulfur myelin, rarely used today because it's painful, uh, is broad spectrum, but it penetrates very well. What are the functions of wound coverage? You want to prote protect and splint the damage that you're feeling. I should mention before transferring a patient to a burn center, it's very important to communicate with a burn surgeon to give an accurate estimate of the bur uh, burn surface area. Some burn surgeons don't want uh, you to put silvidine on the burns because uh, they feel that they can get a better estimate of the total body surface area burn. Um, but that's a judgment call. It's where good communication is important. Um, the advantages of covering the burn are for protection, uh, for pain control, and to reduce the evaporative loss and to uh, control, help control body temperature. When to transfer to a burn unit, uh, this, the American Burn Society has guidelines, uh, recommendations of when to transfer a patient to a burn center, and here they are. Uh, patients who have second and third degree burns involving greater than 10% of the burn surface area. Patients with face and hand burns to any age group. Why? Because you really need plastic surgeons who will take care of burns to take care of cosmesis and, and functional areas. Patients with electrical and lightning burns. We've taken care of some of those patients here. I think that's a judgment call. Um, this is a recommendation, it's, I think, largely for community hospitals. Maybe they don't see a whole lot of trauma. Patients with inhalational injury. Patients with other significant morbidities. Patients with other concomitant trauma, which is major, children, and other patients who require special needs, uh, social, emotional, um, and long term needs. There's a whole separate at the Jordan centers, which most hospitals don't have. Okay. Before you send the patient, keep them warm, cover them with clean steel sheets, uh, get moist 4x4, four four, soak them in normal saline, wring it out, cover that. It keeps the patient comfortable and it protects whatever skin elements are remaining. Uh, early application of topical antimicrobials <coughs> is ideal, but to communicate with the burn surgeon is your preferences. Um, so burn surgery can't be done at a lot of hospitals simply because you need equipment that um, many hospitals don't have. This is a table at a burn unit. As you can see, this is very bloody surgery. Um, blood starts to hang as the operation begins. Uh, this is a shower head that washes blood off of the bed at the end of the procedure. We sometimes have that in our group, but we don't plan it ahead of time. Um, 
surgical burn wound management again, just to, to show you some different, different techniques. This is a, this knife just comes out of the Korean War, but this is a, still some to be used. And there's a plethora of of, um, of new dressings and and other technologies. So after excision, um, when to do excision and grafting? Once you have a, a rock stable patient, okay, one two three days. Once you've got replaced fluids, once you've manipulated the ventilator to optimize oxygenation once renal function is returned. And waiting is certainly uh, associated with improved survival. And also <coughs> early excision is, um, is uh, associated with improved survival. Because this is dead skin that's going to get infected before a patient develops systemic <coughs> sepsis, get rid of the potential source. The benefits of excision and grafting over serial debridement, survival is improved, blood loss is decreased, length of hospitalization is shortened, Money is saved. I'm not going to bother you with questions. That's uh, thermal injury. Right. Take a moment and I'm going to just want to answer. Are there any questions? Just to emphasize in the inhalation injury for early intubation um, as a consideration or it becomes a mess that you can intubate to consider doing that if you have stuff coming out of any more. That's the indication. So, yes. So, you were talking about that uh, a pretty traumatized patient who has an inhalation injury to go along with it to consider early <laughs> intubation in those patients, right? Even though they may have. Um, a stable airway at the time of your initial evaluation. If you've got someone with 50% burns who has any soot coming out of anywhere, who you're anywhere near thinking about inhalation injury, you should consider it early intubation as opposed to once the edema sets in and your intubation becomes a lot more difficult. Okay. Uh, this is a slightly shorter talk on injury. Um, what is cold injury? Uh, it's, there are two categories, systemic hypothermia and localized injury to a body part. Uh, cold injury uh, usually affects an extremity. Um, why are we talking about cold injury in the, in, you know, when, you know, during a time of global warming? I'm not sure if that's is snowing. <laughs> but for, for those of us who take care of um, patients undergoing it, who require any kind of emergency, which is anyone in this room, for those of us who be taking care of displaced persons, those of us who either live or travel to northern latitudes, those of us who like to do sports um, in the areas where the is cold, those of us who might be in the military or who will be or who will be taking care of personnel on military maneuvers, this is something to be aware of. And in Brooklyn, we take care of a lot of people who um, uh, may have a reason to be out on the street on a cold night while asleep and not have a place to go to come in with uh, frostbite or uh, other, other cold injuries. So I, I, I just had to personalize this. This was my summer vacation in northern Norway. This is what Norwegians do in summer. They, they were flattered and happy that I've got the warm weather. This is what you do at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. This is my sister, Alexandra, my niece, Tanya, and her husband, Tudor. What do you do? You put on your jacket, you light a fire, you get, you get out the alcohol and you take your shoes off. <laughs> and this is how you uh, manage thermal injury because you don't feel it. Okay? Or because you're used to it. But these are, these are people who are at risk of thermal injury. It happens, it, it does happen much more frequently in northern latitudes. But it's worth it because when you look out the window, not out the window, off of the patio, that's your backyard. There's the fjord here and there's a, an island just for you. It's empty. And if you get tired of that, or at the end of the day you want to go for a run, that's the beach. You don't have to drive there. You don't have to take the train to Coney Island and call it a beach. This is the beach. <laughs> and if you don't want to run near the water, then you just run, you know, you run in the grass. And kids like it too. This is my daughter. I was afraid she was going to fall in the water and get high me, but I had to get this picture. <laughs> so, systemic hypothermia. What are the reasons that it's advantageous to patients with uh, an MI or with a tra severe traumatic brain injury? It's because it slows the metabolic process, but it's bad if you don't have those injuries, right? It decreases cardiac output, it predisposes to cardiac arrhythmias, AFib, bradycardia, and then ultimately ventricular fibrillation. 
It decreases platelet function. Keep in mind, a lot of patients with hypothermia may have other traumatic injuries, and this is the most common cause of coagulopathy in our trauma patients. Uh, in addition, these patients will have lactic acidosis because of uh, decreased perfusion. So what do we do with a patient, a patient who has hypothermia? Get them out of the water, remove them from the cold environment, bring them inside, get their clothes off quickly, cover them with something warm, sheets, whatever you have available to them. Minimize their movement. You don't want to get them up into the chair, go over the CAT scan, do a piece of for, for x-ray with his arm. Just keep, try to keep them as still as possible until you've warmed them. Uh, for arrhythmias, we, we simply follow uh, AC, ACLS guidelines, correct the acidosis, and we warm at least to a temperature of 36. But hypothermia is defined as a body core temperature under 35 degrees centigrade. People who are at greater <coughs> risk for hypothermia are the elderly, children, uh, people who are infirm, and people who are intoxicated. There are two types of rewarming, passive rewarming, putting the patient in a warm room, blankets, clothing, insulation, and then active rewarming, which can be done either by, by internal or external means. External rewarming, re re excuse me, external rewarming involves the heating pads, warm immersion bath, uh, convection heaters. For internal warming, there can be a variety of things done. So take an IV bag, a one liter IV bag, put it in the microwave for one minute to warm the warm fluid, Give them warm IV fluid. Other options are replacing NG tube, fully catheter, warm water through them, bilateral chest tubes, warm water to the pleural spaces, um, hemodialysis, and external cord and circulation. Uh, as far as mortality is concerned, patients who have a uh, <coughs> temperature uh, under, uh, under 27, their mortality is 60%. Those uh, with moderate hypothermia, their mortality is 50%, and those with mild hypothermia have an increase in mortality of 35%. Um, the cause of death, can there can be prolonged asystole. However, <coughs> remember the saying, they're not dead until they're cold and dead. You can't declare someone dead until their temperature is at least 36. So you keep rewarming them, rewarming them, until, until you can declare that they have the pressure. <coughs> Um, for a localized injury, again, remove the patient from the cold. Remember, patients uh, also may have other traumatic injuries, especially extremity injuries, in addition to hypothermia. You go through ATLS protocol, correct systemic hypothermia with warm fluids, rapid rewarming is the goal of the extremity. You don't want to do this passively. You want to get the extremity warm quickly. Um, if you have frostbite of the foot, they should not walk. You shouldn't warm the extremity. You shouldn't try to rub it to warm it. You don't want to cause even the most minor trauma because you can lose more tissue that way. Keep in mind, for those of you who are into wilderness medicine, or mountain climbing and patients with hypothermia, their, their extremities may also be broken in addition to hospital. There are different categories of uh, localized of hypothermia. Frost nip is the mildest, and there's chill vein and hernia, and frostbite and trench foot. Frostnip is very mild, the skin gets cold, pale and numb after exposure to the cold. I think we've all experienced frostnip. Uh, skiers get this on their face, ears, uh, noses, wherever the skin is exposed. As soon as they get to a warm room, this can be resolved. Uh, for chilbane and hernia, these patients can develop and have a developed vasculitis of the face. The skin is red, swollen, and it blisters. Treatment is the same, food warming at room temperature, and this resolves on its own. Frostbite is more severe. Um, it's a more severe, the most severe form of cold injury of an exposed surface. The initial symptoms can be mild, and they can be overlooked with weakness. The late symptoms are severe heart pain, burning edema, and necrosis, and, and gangrene of distal extremities. The last thing that you want to do here is do early debridement. You want to wait several days to see if and where the patient demarcates, and I'll do amputation only if it's necessary. The pathophysiology is simply that extracellular ice crystals form, uh, causing disruption of the cellular membrane and cellular dehydration. The initial freeze causes vasoconstriction, alternating with vasodilatation, and that's followed by reforming. What can be uh, a mistake here, if you're not in an area where you can provide constant warmth, is to rewarm the patient 
have them go out and freeze the extremity again because we thaw and refreezing, we thaw and refreezing causes more damage in, than the initial freeze. So it's recommended that if you're at a distance from a place where you can be able to warm, if you're beyond two hours away, don't start the warming. <coughs> There are degrees of frostbite, nothing to need to be memorized, but just to understand that with uh, fourth degree frostbite, that's where patients start losing extremities. This is first degree frostbite, just a base trim. Some of the pitfalls in <coughs> treatment of frostbite involve repeated freezing and thawing that worsens tissue injury, rubbing the injured part in ice or snow, rubbing or massaging the affected tissue, which is an thing that maybe we want to do it to alleviate pain, but it actually can cause more trauma to the tissue. Gradual or spontaneous rewarming is not enough. Rapid rewarming at 40 degrees centigrade is the goal. Avoid dry heat, don't get your hair dry out, try to go and warm somebody at that point. The uh, less common injury that we see today, but still, uh, is trench foot. This has historically been related to uh, military, um, when Napoleon retreated from Russia, a lot of the soldiers came out with trench foot and other things, but this is what was really um, mo mo first described uh, during World War I, where soldiers stood in trenches, cold water, for weeks at a time. It's associated with cold and with uh, in infected areas. So these, and these soldiers, they stood in water, soaked with feces for several days in boots that were made of leather or cheaper material, and um, developed a trench foot. It's a, it's a pretty morbid thing, and there were even cases of trench foot reported in the uh, British invasion of the Falklands in the 1980s, when it's surprising when we think that clothing in that time would be more appropriate. But this is something that, can, that we can still see in, in people who are exposed to cold, wet, uh, filthy conditions with, uh, with inadequate clothing. Uh, the treatment is to elevate, uh, first clean the extremity, expose, clean, warm, um, elevate the extremity, to minimize swelling. And that's all I have. I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to see a bunch of uh, open uh, eyes. And um, I'd like to thank all of you. For, I'd like to thank Dr. Jane for inviting us. And uh, I'd like to thank my team in the back. And I'd like to thank all of us for the combined efforts that we do to take care of each other. last year. Um, it was a review article in the New England Journal published in 2012 about accidental hypothermia and uh, another indication to terminate resuscitative efforts is a serum potassium greater than 12. So if you're performing an epic uh, resuscitation <laughs> and rewarming effort on somebody who is very very clearly frozen, draw a peripheral, uh, I, it doesn't matter, draw a central lab sample and send it. Because if their potassium is greater than 12, that is an indication for termination. Dr. Silverberg. Just let's remind you guys to watch for the after drop. As you start to warm them peripherally, their core is not as cold as the skin is. So when you put heaters on them, all that cold blood goes back to the central circulation and can actually make the central circulation colder and put you at risk for arrhythmias. So as you're doing this, make sure you give them warm fluids and watch for after drop and make sure you keep an eye on their rhythm on the monitor. All right, so I'll resend that article. It's a really good article, especially because uh, winter is upon us. And uh, are there any other questions? All right, um, everyone can take 10 minutes, and then we'll, and then Dr. 